Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to say hello to John Doerr, Ana Sanchez, Marina Psukjoy, Andrew Sposky, and Ricardo Lobato. And thank you for accepting the invitation to join us this, uh, this uh, meeting tonight or today, to this morning. I don't know where you are, but um, today. Uh, first of all, I want to, to request a moment in silence in memory of our very good friend Svis Blatt, who passed away yesterday, a so, good friend of us. Thank you very much. Um, the intention today is to, to see a little version about the changes that, that, uh, that our next book, the Racing Rules uh, book. Uh, we go for this uh, uh, short version. We did a, a more complete uh, discussion about this in about a month ago. And it's still, it's still um, available to see if you, it's record in YouTube in the same channel that you are seeing here. You can look in for the version one. Uh, later, Ricardo can put the, the link, highlight the link for see if somebody wants to see the first, the first meeting we did. It's informal also, uh, but we went a uh, little deep deeper in, in the discussion. Um, today, we, we go uh, this quick uh, version about the changes, and then we go that we didn't go, we went last time to the appendix, appendices. So in, in general, the, the, the changes, like just, just, just talking about in general matter, it's now uh, the, the, the new book is talking about whole uh, instead, instead of uh, whole crew and equipment in normal position. Uh, sale the course now is a definition, including support person in many rules, uh, using notes of race instead of sailing instructions, also in many, many uh, situations and rules. And now, uh, also, we have a new exoneration rule that uh, yeah, it's a new rule 37 that we will see. And also, we can see the terminology events uh, versus regatta, and events is a race of our series. Um, I will not invite anyone to, to comment these general changes. And I go straight to the signs um, that we have. We had um, three main changes. We had the orange flag that was already used by the race committee to indicate the size of the starting line. Uh, blue flag was changing the meaning of the race committee is in the finished position, but to these flags in the indicates one side of the finish line. And the victor flag is related to the new rule 37, uh, determining that when displayed means all boats involved in the event, including support person, shall monitor the race committee channel. Um, now I, I will ask uh, John first, if you have any comments uh, till now. No, I've got nothing to add to that, um, Nelson. Um, just to be clear, I think the new exoneration rule is in Rule 43, and there is a new rule on safety, which is Rule 37. Perfect. Anna, something? You, you are moved, Anna. Turn you your microphone on, Anna. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Cool. Um, no, no, I have nothing to add to, to this uh, first part of it. Okay. Uh, Marina? 
Yeah, I have a small uh, comment. There is also there is a notice, a clarification more uh, about languages. And when we, from now on, it is clear that when a hail is made, it can be made in uh, the language that everybody understands or in English. And nice. this was because in the past there were some odd situations where the hail was... Uh, uh, was supposed to be in English, and English was out of context in the in the specific situation. So now it's clear that it can be any language, as long as the people that it is uh, uh, the people that are involved understand. Perfect, Andrus. Yeah, I mean, if Marina already put it up, this hail issue, I think it's uh, one of the the major, um, 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 how to say, outcome from also the Q&A panel, uh, where, where actually we, we really clarified it. And interesting was that uh, many years, actually, including myself, it has been some events in uh, some uh, countries where the, the word, for instance, word protest uh, was not pronounced as a protest. For instance, uh, in China, when they are using the word kai, and when, when you are just for validity, checking the validity of the hearing and ask, did you say protest? And then they said, yes, I hail Kai. Then many, many, many juries said, ah, but that's not valid because you had to say protest. And, and but the some, at the same time, some juries said, yeah, but it, it's okay because he said in no language. So at the moment, I think it creates a lot of consistency all around the world. So now it's clear that you really can use your own language, but responsibility lays on you if the another party understood it or not. So basically, I think the Marina, you can correct me that what we said, uh, it's uh, if, if you are doing like a national event, you can no problem use your own language. But if you're going any international event, you, you might take a risk by not using English. And uh, yeah, so I think that was a very good change. Yeah, that was that's the idea. And in uh, you know, in Spain, Portugal, and these countries, Italy, protest sounds very much like in English. But in in Greek, we say enstasi, and it has nothing to do. So it has yeah. to be clear that it's fine to say enstasi, which it was the word that I was always using. I mean, okay. unless but it was yeah. abroad. If I may answer, actually, it's also a very funny story. Um, I used to ask some people, uh, because we know that in a rule book, we have uh, two words, actually three words, which are between the quotation marks. Okay, One is the word protest. Another one is rule 20, you tack. And that's why I asked uh, people who translated the books, that uh, did you translate the protest? And they said, no, 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 I did not, because it has to be in English. And, uh, and then I asked, okay, but what about the word you tack? And then they looked open book. Oh, we really translated it already. <laughs> so that that actually shows that uh, even they didn't know that they actually translated those rules, even by declaring that it, if it's between the quotation marks, you we are not allowed to uh, translate it. So yeah, that was quite funny. Funny part. Yeah, the, we when we were discussing the Q and A, we did the we did the research on that, on how it is translated in different uh, languages, and even in, uh, in countries that use the same language, but different countries had, uh, had a different approach to it. So I think that this is a very small detail, and it might uh, look uh, insignificant, but I think that it adds consistency, and people that do not have English as their first language, understand the value of it a lot more than, than our chairman. Uh, Blue, do we have any comments from the audience? Uh, no comment, but we have a lot of friends. Jeff from California, Alf Paul, Maria Ribeiro, uh, Steve from Greece, and uh, Turk from, from Belgium, a lot of experience. Bernabé, uh, you have a lot of uh, experience here in our audience. Very good. Let's go ahead. Okay. So then, then we go to definitions. Uh, in definitions, the, we highlight uh, two, 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 three definitions that change. One is start and another 
this is finished. It's changing from the uh, whole equipment and crew in normal position to when the first part of the hole crosses the line. Um, note that the power spread and the outer roots are not part of the hole. In most of the case, it become easier for the race, race committees. And also, for me, it makes a lot of sense that sail the course now is a definition. Before it was part of rule 28. Um, and, um, and for me, it's, it's a, a good, good, uh, good change. Uh, comments, um, I will start again, but, but this time with Anna. Um, yeah, well, I will, I will um, confirm that say the course is, is now a definition um, and it will help uh, the interaction of uh, old rule 28.2 and 35 and some others. And there was a conflict before in the way these rules interact. And now, uh, I think it is solved. It is. You are talking about you are talking about thirty five and uh... thirty five and nineteen point three. I think it is. Uh, so now it is it is a better. Everything matches better. Mm -hmm. uh, it is clear the sail the course been sail the course and not start and go around the marks. So it's a different it's a different animal. Mm -hmm. uh, um, John, no, nothing. I think we covered all that in the in the first um, in the first session a month ago. Okay, perfect. Um, this time, uh, Andrews. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is one of the the most important uh, changes in the new new rule book, and I'm really happy on that. Uh, two reasons. First of all, it really clarifies the, the different uh, issues. And we remember the one issue uh, usually came from multi hulls when Nakras went uh, finishing downwind and, um, and uh, sometimes they're capsizing and drifting through the, through the finishing line. And then there's a different pieces of equipment. And question is which, which moment they, they are finishing and if they're finishing at all. So now it's, yeah, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what, what position is your hull upside down or, or stern ahead, uh, so it's just a hull, need, need to cross the line. And, uh, and second uh, importance of this change is that uh, by, um, by taking only the hull of the boats, it really opens the door for the new, new technology. Because as we know that uh, we, we always talk about that we should have a kind of electronic starts and finishes and, and so on, and the problem was was because it's very difficult to put the, the trackers on a, on a boat at the same time with a, equipment and crew. So if you're spinnaker flying and it's, it's, you know, and so on, so on. So now it's very clear, it's a hull. So I really hope that this opens the, the possibility and opportunity to start creating uh, technology which, which can in future record the, the starts and finishes and reducing the human factor in it. And then we change the definition again, saying that when the boat start or finish when they, the equipment device cross the line, <laughs> not the hull, the equipment, the electronic equipment, in order to to set. It. Um, Marina, do you have something to add, or can we go forward? I think that. Even if we reach the point where we will say that the equip if you start when your equipment crosses the line, uh, it, is, it is a rule and it will be what it will be. We just need something consistent. It doesn't matter what it will be as long as it is consistent, the same for everyone. And we will be able to judge it uh, reliably and in a fair way. So I, I don't see a problem in that, but I think that it is pretty, it's pretty far away. It's not something that will happen in the next uh, two, three years. Okay. Yes, yes. yes Anders. If I may open one, one discussion on that, because I already 
had some discussion with different people, and uh, as you may understand, the, the question is about the bowsprits. And uh, many and different classes, different shape of the, the boats and hull. Sometimes the, the bowsprits are attached, sometimes they are removable, sometimes they are a kind of part of the hull. The question is, what about the bowsprit? Is it part of the hull or not? And, and there are some uh, actually different opinions on that. So I think this, this is maybe, uh, maybe to even discuss slightly here what, what the opinion of different people. Uh, I may give my, my, my own op opinion is that uh, the bowsprit is not part of the hull unless it's coming from the sail mold, uh, sail mold, you know, or it is like some boats they have already, it is, it is like a part of hull, it's not attached to the deck. Uh, but, uh, but of course the classes can, can make it very clear through the class rules. But I think that might be one of the issues in future, starting from next year, where uh, different people uh, may interpret it differently. So I don't know, Nelson, if I may ask, what is the opinion now from people, if we are on the same page or different opinions? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think if, if, if it's appendix, so it's appendix that you can, or, or is not part of the mold, is, is not part of the whole. And uh, this is also, uh, I believe this is right. But uh, I, I follow a lot of uh, forums where the discussion, the discussions go and on, going on, and, and there is nothing in in uh, in the equipment uh, rules of sailing that that state just saying that is a as a, a draw there where the appendix the, where the bowsprit is not part of the whole. Um, comments from John. Nothing really to say. I mean, I for me, I think that the hull is. I'm just looking at the equipment rules of sailing to see uh, what the definition of hull is in equipment rules of sailing. But for me, a bowsprit is not part of the hull. It's a bowsprit. It's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is what we have. Yeah, exactly. Anna. Yeah, I, I quite agree with John and and Andrews. I mean, about spread, it, in principle, is not part of the hull. Um, class rules can make a different definition. So for sure, we need to, to pay attention to the class rule and keep, uh, and keep them updated when we are working with these kind of boats. And, and maybe um, some class, some classes will want to, to try uh, a route in, uh, about bow spreads, and then they will change their mind. So I can anticipate some changes in the glass rules coming from this area. Marina? Well, I, I think that whatever we, whatever we agree, it's fine. I, of course, I agree with, uh, with John that the equipment rules of sailing say that hull is a hull and bowsprit is something else. So, the your your microphone was out. Now? Now it's okay. Now, okay. So, uh, I I agree with John that the the I, it's not agreement with John. It's agreement with the equipment rules of sailing that we know what the hull is and what the bowsprit is. If we if we want to change that, it's a matter of uh, of agreement with uh, thinking as a race officer. I think that it will be practically impossible to identify whose bowsprit is over the line if you are if you are judging it on a on a starting line, or it will be challenging if not as uh, as difficult to to judge it on a finishing line. So I think that. Uh, as we are right now, with the bowsprit not being uh, part of the of the hull, we are quite good. Uh, Blue, do we have any comments from the audience? Or yes, question? we have very good comments, and and uh, we have some disagreement about uh, uh, if this change will make the life easier for the race committee or not. Maybe the catamarans with the wings and, uh, and the, the people on trapeze can be confused. Michael 
said that. And uh, just a point, guys. I think we discussed this a lot. We are 20 minutes. I'm afraid we cannot get uh, the pens. Eh? And also, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> because we can discuss this forever. But I, I have a good question, Dirk. Uh, Dirk asked, are the fixed wing on the foreign area? Uh, no part of the rule. This is a question for Dirk. I think it's a good question. Um, John? Well, I'm sure we're going to get a Q&A coming in that we're going to have to answer um, to, to at least get some consistency in this because people are going to have a different opinion depending on whether whether bits are bolted onto the, the whole shell or whether they're part of the moulding, does that make any difference? And I'm sure that we're going to have to do some work, some work on that. Um, but, but the equipment rules of sailing are pretty helpful. I mean, they do define the hull. The hull is the shell of the hull, including the transom deck, including any superstructure, internal structure, internal structure, not external structure, including the cockpit and fittings, so, and the bowsprit is defined as well. So it's very clear that the hull is not, in, in terms of equipment rules of sailing, the hull or the bowsprit is not part of the hull because they're defined separately. So, um, and I would have thought there's no reason for the racing rules to interpret these parts differently from the equipment rules of sailing. Because we need consistency between the, between the two. Okay. Uh, Anna, do you want to add something? No, not really. Thank you. I mean, all I say is, I mean, if, if it's molded, the bowsprit is attached to the hull by bits of fiberglass and resin. It's still attached to the hull. No different from drilling holes and screwing and screwing screwing bolts through. It's attached to the hull. It's it's just that the method of fixing is different. It's still an attachment fixed to the hull. In my engineering sense. <laughs> okay, uh, Andrews. Yeah, very, very, very briefly. Actually, John pointed uh, out very, very interesting points. So we need to define in which in which section, which part the hull stops and starts attachment. The same discussion what we had about the torso. What is what? Which part is torso? Where the torso starts and when it ends? <laughs> and and you, we used to say that from hips yeah. to neck, you know, and so on, so on. So yeah, but if you look in the ERS and you look at hull dimensions, the hull length is very clear in the diagrams where the hull starts and finishes. I, I mean, I really think that it's we could make an awful lot of this, but I think it's pretty clear um, what the equipment rules are sailing. Um, say about it, and I say I just don't see any reason why there's no justification for the thanks, Le thanks, um, Blue. There is no justification that I can see for the racing rules to come up with different definitions and different descriptions than the equipment rules of sailing in this instance. And, and unless, unless because of this new change or rule, they want to review the equipment rules. But at the moment, as you said, it, it's there. Why would yeah, they want to do that? Yeah, this this equipment racing uh, rules uh, of sailing uh, is new. This this just just come uh, re uh, updated. Uh, so it's it's not not the old version. This is this is updated now. Right. Okay, perfect. Uh, Marina, do you want to add something or can we go forward? Okay. So then, then we go to the fundamental rules and we start uh, highlight uh, rule two, saying that uh, penalties for unfair sailing is no longer excluded. Um, uh, this is something that's going forward, uh, was uh, excluded uh, in in the last book and now it's uh, no no excluded uh, and the penalties these penalties are related to infractions during the competition um, 
before I ask some comments, I go to, I will talking about roof, the new uh, fundamental rule uh, five. Um, that uh, that saying that rule race officials and organizers uh, must observe those uh, the rules before this 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 rule was hiding in uh, rule 84 and now it's promoted to fundamental rule that for me uh, it's important that all the organizers their of uh, race officials they 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 need to, to follow the, the same rules. So comments, uh, I will ask uh, now Marina if, if she wants to, 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 to talk about uh, these comments or, or if she think it's important something else in fundamental rules. No? I think that John is the best person to, to talk about that. I mean, I have things to say, but he can... Uh, <laughs> say the whole idea. I keep my uh, inspiration for later. Okay, John. Well, I, again, I think we covered it last time. I don't know how much you want to repeat what we did, what we did last time. Whether we've got a lot of different people, or whether we've pretty much got the same audience. I, I don't know. Um, I think it's important that this isn't a change of rule. It's giving more prominence to the rule that officials have to comply with the rules. And it seems it just seems pretty sensible <laughs> that, that it's it's fundamental. We expect competitors, support people, and organisers to comply with the rules. Um, and we've cleaned up with regards to regulations. I don't think it's worth talking about a lot. There's there's no change of effect. It's just organisation of the rules. Okay, Blue, you are sharing your uh, WhatsApp for with everybody. Oops. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Yes. Uh, okay, so um, Anna, do you do do you have something to add? Oh, not really. Nothing new. Okay. Good. Um, Andrus, any comments? Just one, one, just, just one one word. It really helps for consistency again. So. I think it's good. Okay. Okay. So, um, something to add, um, Marina, or can we go forward? Keep going. All good. Okay. So we go part two. Um, as you see, we are going uh, just pick pick up the uh, the. the part of the review that we did last time. So it's just a quick pass, uh, not so quick, but it's a quick. So now we, we highlight uh, rule 16.2 uh, that uh, changed some uh, in order to, to highlight this. It's only when a bit to windward and, and change the passing to stern to passing to leeward of the boat. Uh, the, the, the spirit of the rule uh, has not changed. Uh, any comments? Just one quick comment, Nelson. I mean, we know that the phrase beats to windward causes some difficulty in translation because not every language that the rule book is being translated into actually has the word beat as a noun and they have to use some words to describe it rather than directly translate. Um, and we know there's an issue there. Uh, there's a submission that we've got to decide in three weeks time, um, which will be a revision of case 132. And, and I think we need to wait until that has gone through and we've sorted that out uh, before we respond to questions on it so that we make sure that we're giving the right answer. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, in the last in the last um, uh, meeting, we 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 discuss a lot also about uh, rule one three two, and uh, and um, and we know that it's under review. Andrews, do you want to talk something? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anna. No. Um. I think it's going to be very important to have a look at uh, the new version of uh, case 
uh, once in two when it comes up. Okay. Uh, Blue, do you have some something to add or any comments or, or questions to you now? No, no, there is just a uh, part of the audio said uh, Josie can't wait for for the paint. I think uh, there, there are some umpires and and some people who want to discuss the, the paint. Just, just a comment. Okay. Hmm. And then we go to part three. So as, as we said before, rule 48, now it's, it's more uh, cleaning because we don't have the definition of sailing, of course, but anyway, we need to read the, the sailing, sailing course. Uh, say again. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. We, we, uh, so rule, rule 28, 28 um, uh, we, uh, drive us to definition of sailing course before it was in the book. Um, this is only that we highlight for part three. And then we go part four, that rule 42 now uh, proportion is allowed to condition of pumping to start foil. Um, and uh, rule 43, was created to include exonerations that were spread over the several several chapters of the boat, such old 14.B, 21, and 64.1B. Um, rule 48.2 clarifies, clarifies when a crew member is in the water but connected to the boat, is is racing is racing before he needs to be on board. I will stop here uh, because a lot of rules and um, I want to see to, to hear uh, John. Any comments on that? On which one? Uh, 48.2. Okay. Um, yeah, this was always a, this was a problem before when the boat capsized and people really thought it was linked to the definition, but it really wasn't linked to the definition. Um, the problem was if you capsized and you're on a downwind leg, the boat will make progress in the race. And if you were not on board, you broke the rule <laughs> simply by capsizing. And um, We've now fixed that. So what you're not allowed to do is to resume sailing the boat. There's nothing to prevent or no rule is broken if the boat makes progress towards the next mark because you're not sailing it if it's capsized now the only thing you can't do is to drop somebody overboard and the rest of the crew keep sailing towards the next mark then you break the rule so you've got to stop for the people to help them get back to the boat um, so you no longer break a rule if you're in the water and the boat makes progress. So even if it crosses the finishing line, as we now, as we said earlier, it's no longer um, connected to the crew. So you will finish when the whole first part of the whole crosses the finishing line, and you probably will not break rule uh, forty-eight un unless you uh, unless somebody on the boat tries to sail it across the line. If you're in the water and push the boat across the line, by the way, you'll probably break rule forty-two. <laughs> okay, so the, the secret here is in contact with the boat. So if you are swimming behind, trying to catch the boat and cross the line, you are not in contact with the boat. Correct. Okay. Um, so because, if, and that's because nobody knew what the term... We, we used the phrase on board before, and nobody knew what the phrase on board meant. Did that mean it could be upside down and you're standing on the hull? Are you on board or does the hull have to be the right way up? Well, as long as you're in contact with the hull, we don't care. Because nobody can get an advantage from it. That's what we worked out. There's no point in having a rule that you can't get advantage from breaking. Okay. So now rule 50. Um, Changing, changing the weight limits for clothing and equipment that the sailor can use was uh, setting very strict 
requirements for trapeze from uh, 2023 on, onwards. Um, so, so this this uh, this new new uh, place where the, the, this rule was set, and um, I will ask Anna if she wants to comment on that. Um, not really. I mean, the, the the rule is quite clear. Um, but as far as I have heard from Young, uh, there is there there might be a problem with the limit of six kilograms. And and it's going to be discussed by the Racing Rules Committee in, in a couple of, couple of weeks. So again, people should pay attention to this, um, to this part and 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 try to find out how the discussion is decided. John? I'll just confirm what Anna says. We think there might be a problem. The six kilos was justified in part by moving to quick release harnesses. But the quick release harnesses doesn't come into force until January until 2023. So move so having a weight limit of six kilo before you have quick release harnesses, we might have created a problem. Understood. So now I will ask uh, I will ask if somebody wants to comment on part three on the rules that we saw in uh, 21 to 28 to, to 50. Uh, start with uh, Andrus. Yeah, I don't want to waste time, but I think that's uh, that's another important change in the rules. What I'm really happy and um, and um, I remember exactly the case I I explained before with with the NACRAS and so on when when a boat is is drifting through the finishing line and somebody is swimming back of the boat and is not in contact and definitely not on the board. And the question was, did the boat finish? Uh, the answer is yes, but he broke rule forty seven point two. That time now it's a new rules. It's a forty eight point two. And um, and now it, it really reclarifies really because at the same time those the same people who said that yes but he broke rule forty eight point two uh, by crossing a line so he upright the boat and sail back and cross it again um, uh, uh, but if the same exact the same situation and downwind as John explained that the boat just capsizes uh, or, or not actually capsizing the let's say the laser the hiking strap gets off and uh, the the sailor falls in the water. And the boat still sails alone 20, 30, 50 meters and then capsizes. And then the guy had to swim to the boat. So technically that 20, 30, 50 meters boat was sailing without crew on board. So technically he broke and actually the current rule book, what we have now, is breaking rule 27.2. And there was said, no, no, but this is ridiculous. It, it cannot be because this happens every day and this is okay, which I totally agree, it's okay. But at the same situation, when we are trying the finishing line, between this 20, 30, 50 meters, then suddenly it's not okay anymore. So we have been not consistent, uh, the current situation, and this change really removes this this uh, this inconsistency or this this problem. And just adding the what John said that about the swimming behind and not getting advantage, and, and I fully agree. And if somebody really swimming ahead of the boat, that's not that sport. It's another sport. It's not sailing. <laughs> so it's maybe swimming. <laughs> So I thought I'm really, really happy on this this change. Okay. Uh, Marina, do you have something to, to add to this part? No, I think we have covered it. Okay. Uh, Blue? No, no comment. No question, no comment. Okay. So part five, uh, rule 62.1. Now it's necessary to give redress to give redress for damage or injury that the infringed boat has take, taken a proper penalty. Um, and, and rule sixty three point six include included the possibility to to bring the hearsay to a protest. So I will open this for comments, uh, starting with uh, John. <laughs> okay. Um, what we have found out in the last, well, for a long time, is that all sorts of different people have different views about what is hearsay. And it, it, it seems that that word is even defined differently in different languages in different countries. Um, for instance, most people would be surprised 
that if a race officer brings to a hearing a, a sheet from his uh, mark rounding boat with a list of the order of which the boats rounded the mark, and he brings that list without bringing the person to the hearing, that is hearsay in some definitions. Um, and so what is happening, uh, and we've copied, uh, in fact, we've copied civil law in the UK, which says, yeah, we take hearsay, we, we're not going to try and decide what is hearsay and what isn't, because that's very difficult and creates all sorts of debates about whether it is hearsay or not. What the protest committee have to do is under Delta in 63.6, they have to give the weight appropriate to the evidence presented. So if I was on a protest committee and a race committee brings in a piece of paper with a mark roundings, of the boats going around the mark, we take that evidence and I would give that reasonable weight because why would that not be a correct record of the mark rounding? On the other hand, if somebody comes into a hearing and says, oh, my mate saw the incident and he told me that the other boat broke a rule, well, that's hearsay too. I wouldn't give that very much weight at all. So the whole way that we've approached this is you take any evidence that is presented and you give it the weight that you think it is worth when you're making the evidence. And this, this also, this weight thing is just as important as the hearsay thing because it, it hasn't been in the rule before that we give weight, we give different weight to evidence. Um, so we're not calling people liars or, or whatever. We just went, because quite often you come out of a hearing and somebody says, oh, he, he told lies, he, a different story. And why didn't you, why did you believe him or you didn't believe me? It's not a question of belief or telling lies. It's a question of we give weight to which evidence is most convincing. And I think that's a helpful um, way for the protest committee to behave. Perfect. Okay, uh, before we go to the appendix, anyone wants to comment on that or anything from the rules because we go to appendix A? Okay, Blue? Yeah, very, Mariana? Yeah, very fast to, to what John said. It's not that we, uh, we, we were, the protest committees were giving weight to, the, to evidence anyway. I mean, sometimes you hear something from someone and you, you think that it's more likely than something that someone else said. It's just that now it is more formally written, but it's not, it's not a game change. It's not something different than what has been happening until now. I agree totally. We've always given different weight to different evidence. We've always done it. We have, haven't had a rule to support us. Perfect. Okay, so we go to Appendix A that we highlight uh, the, the change A5.1 that provide, provides that the race committee realize that the boat has not sailed the course. It can score as NSC, not sail the course without a hearing. So in our, in our opinion, this is the most important change in, in Appendix A. Uh, I will ask Anna to comment on that. Um, well, I think it is it's a, it's a huge step forward. Um, I think that if the race committee is absolutely convinced that a boat has not changed the course, then um, there, was, there was no reason to go through the protest committee in order to stay, to reflect that in the, in the scoring. So now, uh, with, the, with the new rule, a five point one, uh, the race committee will initially score that boat uh, accordingly uh, as not saying the course. And if the boat uh, wants to challenge the decision of the race committee, the boat can ask for redress. So the boat is still has um, the possibility to react if they think the decision by the race committee is wrong, but. Um, but the race committee will take care of this core themselves. 
Okay, can we go to Appendix B, blue? How we we are how we are going? I can briefly comment that, Nelson, if you want. Andrews, do you want to 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 add something? Yeah, I mean <clears throat> that's so so called one of the babies, <laughs> and I think the the most most important change on this is that. The appendix B, Bravo, is much, much shorter now. So technically what happened was that, uh, uh, as you can see, all the, already the title of the rule, it says windsurfing fleet racing rules. It's not windsurfing racing rules anymore, which means that the, all other disciplines, uh, except the fleet racing, has been removed from this book. So, I mean, like a slalom rules, uh, expression rules, they are, all, they, they are still existing. They are good rules. They are working rules but they are available online only. So, um, uh, so in a world sailing website, uh, people can, can find it and, uh, and the rules are there. So on a book, we're only keeping the, the fleet racing rules. Um, one, another general <coughs> comment on that is um, uh, like a new, new Olympic windsurfing class, uh, IQ foil, uh, which also using kind of one of the formats is the slalom. And, um, and there has been the first event on, on end of the August, we're using this, uh, two rules. Like, so one is the racing rules of sailing, which is normal rules. And then another, another set was the slalom rules. However, uh, in future, it will be used exactly the same rules because the slalom itself can be also a part of fleet racing. <clears throat> it doesn't mean <clears throat> that it's immediately the, under the slalom rules because technically the slalom rules are more rules for the like organizer how to run the specific slalom event, but the like um, uh, right away rules or the basic uh, slalom rules are still part of the fleet racing. So that's why in these rules, um, and actually the same applies more or less. Marina can speak about Appendix F later on. Um, uh, we are using the specific uh, format with uh, elimination or reaching starts, there are specific rules in this windsurfing fleet racing rules, for instance, like rule 17, which tells you how to act 30 seconds before the starting signal and so on, so on, some limitations. And also, as we know that the slalom rules, their uh, hearing system is different. So there is a no, no need to have any written protest and all the hearings will be run orally. So, so this is also part of this windsurfing fleet racing rules. If they are using um, this elimination uh, format. So basically, uh, it makes much simpler to use the same set of the rules as for uh, so-called course racing, as for slalom racing, which is not special slalom event. So that's kind of major, major change of it. I mean, if you want later on through the go some specific changes on it, you want to now or, or later on, I don't know, Nelson, how you want. Okay, the idea today is, is highlight the, the, the most uh, impact changes uh, because later I want to invite you uh, and more and somebody else to, to, to discuss deeper. Yeah. Uh, for for uh, appendix, uh, appendix B. So then, then, say again. So then, then a couple of more comments. Then, then I can just finish about this. So, so critical changes. One is that the flag Zulu has been removed for windsurfing because it never has been used, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's it doesn't make any sense to to have a something in a rule book if you're never using it and there's no intention to rule it. So that's one thing. And what is really important change is Rule Forty Two. And which has been changed that even if, if you're reading this, we all know that the windsurfing you're allowed to pump, you know, pumping is, is okay. But technically, if you really take open the rule book and if you read it now, it says that, of course, you need to use the, the water to the hull and the wind to the sail with unassisted actions by sailor. So the main, many, many people asking, including myself, but what is the pumping? It is assisted action, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, uh, it can be different interpretation on that, that even now the pumping is not okay. So this has been uh, absolutely fixed. And now it, it absolutely says that what is allowed and what is not. So it clearly says that the pumping and funding the sale is permitted. 
So it, it really clarifies what the windsurfers can do and what, what they cannot do. And that's, I think, one of the good, good changes. Okay. Um, Anna, do, do, do you have any, anything to add? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> John? No, nothing. Okay, Marina? Uh, this was Andrus's uh, baby, and uh, I think he covered everything. <laughs> okay, Blue, do we have any comments from the audience or, or questions that uh, we, we need to answer now? As no, 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 no question. No question from the audience, but uh, I have a question, Andrus. I got a, li a little confused. So, the Lalo uh, race can be considered a fleet race uh, race. Uh, and they can use this this rule in the, in the book, not the, the online one. Yes, so basically for a slalom, because if, if you're running event, which is not specific slalom event, then you can use the fleet racing rules. Uh, and the slalom is just part of, because you can have a different formats, like uh, in, uh, in a windsurfing now, you technically have three formats. You have a course racing, so-called uh, uh, normal course race. Then you have a marathon, long distance, and you may have a slalom. So it's like a part of the event. Uh, and that's the thing, that the, the slalom rules are more, it's like a more for organizers. It's not nothing, not that, that much for the sailors. So it's like how to run the slalom event. So if you have a specific slalom event, technically you may run under the, the slalom rules, but you may use also these this rules. It's up to the organizer which, which rules they're using. So, Marina wants to start. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I want to make a clarification because I had the, I had the same, uh, the same uh, question or doubt that I think that our audience has when I started dealing with this. So slalom can be uh, it can be a course, a downwind slalom, but also slalom is a, is a way of uh, a way of scoring. Instead of putting everyone together in one uh, in one fleet to start all together, and then we we score who finishes first, second, third, we split them in little groups, and they they sail against each other, and they advance to the next uh, to the next stage. So there is. The, these these races, these little races, are sailed under the same rules that we are sailing the the, the fleet races with the full fleet. The the difference is how we how we score them, and as Andrew says, how the organizer organizes the the pitch and the communication with the people and who goes from one one stage to another. So it's not something that. When the sailors go in the water, start, sail the course and finish, they will use different rules. It's not going to affect the sailors during the race. It is at a different, the difference is at a different level. I hope this clarification helps. Okay. And uh, I think I understand. So if the motor race, say the paint to be applies and uh, there is uh, upper wind, down wind and uh, slalom course, we can use it. I think it's clear, more clear now. Nelson, now it's time for a paint six match race. I see a lot of umpires in the audience, so I think they are waiting for the appendix C. Okay, so appendix C, we highlight uh, C 2.15, that new rule 41E. Um, help to recover from the water and return on board a crew member provide a return on board is approximate location of the recovery also uh, the starting sequence now seven minutes is in the rule before was uh, every time uh, changing by the same instructions and c7.2 all penalties uh, um, F, if one boat has finished and is no longer racing and the other boat has an outstanding penalty, the umpires may cancel the outstanding penalty. This is new. Uh, before we had a lot of time that we, we discussed why 
the the boat with uh, outstanding penalties needs to to take the penalty even if he he lost the the match. And the the, the answer that I had that makes sense to me was because in case that the boat after finish was disqualified for something, the boat that winning, then the second boat that didn't take the penalty cannot be the winner. Um, and now uh, this is fixed because even if uh, he don't take the penalty, um, he's okay. And C10.7, uh, when only one boat is in the match, match failed to sail the course, he shall be scored no points without a hearing. So this is what we found uh, as, a, as a change. So, and, and comments, John? Yeah, I'll spend, I mean, I'm no longer an international umpire, so I'm not as good at Appendix C as I as I was a few years ago. But as Richard Slater is not able to join us, uh, the changes in Appendix C come from uh, three main uh, causes. One is because we changed the main rules in, in the book. So like the whole, the starting, finishing definition and all of those changes have consequential changes, especially for taking penalties that finish lines, etc. So that's one reason. Uh, the other thing is the, the, the team race, sorry, the match racing working party went through the match racing standard sailing instructions that were being used pretty much around the world and put a number of those from the sailing instructions into the rule book. Um, and, and this is one of them, uh, the boat that when a boat finishes and she has an outstanding penalty, it was a pretty standard sailing instruction. In fact, it's quite good to test new rules by making them sailing instructions for a rock for a while. Then we test them, and then if they work, and we think they have uh, an application across the whole discipline, they go into the rule book. So they don't really change the game because the game was already changed. Um, the other uh, source of changes, again, doesn't change the game. It is a review of the call book to see are there any rules that we can either clarify or introduce uh, into the appendix and get rid of calls um, so that there's just less documents for competitors to read. So it's my belief that match racing as such has not changed with the new rule book in any significant way. Okay. Anna, do you want to add something? Um, no, really. No, thank you. Okay. Andrews? No, thank you. Marina? It's not a, it's not a big uh, addition, just to echo what John said. It, it, there, is a, there is an effort to, to make less documents, uh, shorter sailing instructions, uh, not having to put things that we use in all the events in the, in the not so race. And that may, may make the, the rules seem different, but in, in reality, there is, no, there is no game change. Okay, Blue, um, you are not sharing any screen. It's just a black uh, for us. And uh, do you have any, any comments or any questions in, in this appendix? Okay, I can answer that. And, and that is because the 18.3 in Appendix C is different from fleet racing. And it does not make sense to... So, so this exoneration does not apply to fleet racing. 
it only applies to match racing under the match racing 18.3. And so it makes no sense to move that into the, the main rules. And also may, may, may cause uh, uh, confusion because if you you'd have to, I, I don't even know how you'd write it into the main rules because you'd have to say in match racing when 18.3c applies, then about, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all to put it into the main rule 43. Okay. Okay, so can we go to Appendix D, Team Race Rules? Okay, let's go. And I think you're going to get the same comments from me on, on Team Racing about the cause of 98% of, of, of the changes in the Team Racing are for exactly the same reasons as Match Racing. And I do not believe there's any significant game changes in Team Racing. Yeah, what I... I have a uh, highlight here, it's a um, uh, protest boat by boat. Uh, when a boat protests under a rule of part two or, or under 32 or 42 for an accident in a racing area, she's not entitled to a hearing uh, and the following applies. A, uh, I think this is the same, B is the same, C. If no boats take a penalty or clearly, clearly indicates that she will not to do so, the umpire shall decide what, whether to penalize any boats. That is one of the, the changes. And D, if more than one boat break, breaks a rule, an umpire shall decide whether to penalize any boats that did not take a penalty. So, so Nelson, there is one significant change to team racing. Um, and that is the the so-called two um, the two flag system has been deleted, which was a, a second stage on 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 the protest before you called for an umpire decision, and that having that option in the original rule book meant that some of the rules had to be uh, written in a different way. Now that that option has been removed from the book because it's never been used in the last four years, as far as we know. It was, so it was removed from the book that enabled team racing to simplify uh, some of its other rules. So there are consequential rule changes as a result of removing. Um, there's a whole section that has been removed. Um, two flag protest procedure, which was Delta 2.5. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the penalties imposed by umpires you are you yeah. are talking about yes With the two flag procedure yeah yeah mm -hmm. a boat penalized by an umpire shall take a two pen, two turn penalties however when a penalty is, is imposed under rule at two, d 2.3 an umpire's hails or si signs the number of turns the boat shall take that numbers of one turn penalties yes so, uh, so there's okay. no game change. It's just clarification of the, of the game. Okay. Any comments on that, uh, Anna? Not for me. Thank you, Nelson. Okay. Andrus? No. Okay. Marina is saying no. And Blue, do you, do you have any questions yes. or comments? We have uh, a comment, Mark is saying that uh, D2.6 limited umpire was also deleted. I think it's, it's also... Yes. And D4, the score has uh, a major regret. He, he's asking what, what was the reason for changing the score? But, well, the reason that D2.6 was removed was because it was never used. Um, it was one of those that was kept as an option for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, what's the change for changing the scoring? Um, there, was, <laughs> there was quite a debate about... Um, what, what points should a boat get 
uh, if she doesn't retire after finishing. Um, and there have been lots of changes to the sailing instructions, so this change, I understand from Richard Thompson, brings the rules into line with the most recent uh, set of, of common sailing instructions. Um, and, and basically, what team racing says is there's no difference between coming, la between coming last. You don't want to give um, extra points for boats that are penalised. That They get points for last place if they don't finish or if they're disqualified or whatever. They get points for last place. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that when you look in a team race at the situation during a team race about which team is winning, uh, all people who team race understand totally that if the total points adds up to less than 10, you're winning the race. But if you have an unknown point for a boat that might be not retired or whatever, and you don't know what that boat's going to do, that might upset the scoring of the race. So it's very difficult to know in real time who's winning who's winning the race. And, okay. and team racers don't like that. Uh, Blue, anything else? No, great explanation. Thank you, John. And uh, just uh, this is a comment from, from, from Blue. Uh, I really like also... Um, the search of the the procedure that uh, about who who is willing to take a penalty now uh, he can uh, make a sign and and if he she, uh, her she doesn't take the penalty she will be penalized i think this is interesting uh have this used to be a procedure now is inside the rule i i think it's a good point a good proof for appendix b d yeah, it just simplifies the whole process. I agree. I think now so we, we, we can move on. Okay. So let's uh, go for radio sailing racing rules. Um, this uh, appendix E uh, changes to part one, two, and, and seven. Um, A, E, one, three, B requires that a hail for whom to tack on the rules 20.1 and 20.3 shall include the words room and tack and the sail number of the hailing boats in, in any order. E2, additional rules while racing. E2.1, hail requirements. And shall, the hail shall be made and repeated as appropriate so the competitors who on uh, held it is direct, mean, reasonable, be expected to hear it. As a result of this change, the phrase and repeat has been removed for several other rules. Mm -hmm. Also, E3.9 disable competitors. The race committee may make or permit reasonable arrangements to assist disabled competitors to compete in equal terms as possible. Uh, without uh, break rule 41. Um, e 4.2 outside help. Help from the race committee is more general than previous. C, when the boat is disabled or in danger, help from the race committee. Uh, e 4.3, taking a penalty. Uh, B, if a boat gain an advantage, in, in a hit or a race by breach, despite taking a penalty, her penalty shall be additional one turn penalties until her, her advantage is lost. Uh, this, clarify, this clarifies that multiple turns may be required and removes the ambiguous wording in the world version. This is what we, we pick from the Appendix E. Who wants to, to talk? John? Uh, well, I don't know that much about radio sailing. I've only done it twice this, this, this last uh, cycle. Um, but again, I believe that all of these uh, changes 
they're generally simplifications and just complying with the game as the game is played. So there's no change in repeating the hail. It's just moved the word repeat from about four different rules and put it into one rule. So that whenever you have to make a hail, you can always repeat the hail until it's been understood. Uh, and I think the most important thing is that the, 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 um, the radio sailing community are very proud of the fact that they've got a sport that people with quite significant disabilities are able to enjoy. And uh, so E3.9 um, is probably the most important change because it is being very proactive towards disabled people. And so if you are receiving help from anybody solely to overcome what is a disability, then you do not break rule 41. So if you have, if you are, for instance, if you uh, have a speech difficulty and you cannot hail, you can now have somebody else to make those hails for you. Um, all sorts of, all, there's all sorts of, uh, of things that are really helpful uh, for people with disabilities. Okay. Uh, Anna, do you want to comment on that? No, I, I just quite agree with John. This is just some changes reflecting how the game is actually played uh, at events around the world. I don't think it, this is going to be a significant change at all. Okay. Anna, um, Marina, sorry. So, um, I just uh, agree with what John said. Okay. I think we should. I think we should push to get radio sailing a Paralympic sport. Yeah, it would be a good, good move. That's a good idea. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's very, it's very low cost compared with almost all other sailing activities. <laughs> it's it's very easy to televise. It's very user friendly. It's got a lot of merits, and and it would be. It would be quite an interesting uh, Paralympic sport. Easy, easy also to cover. Easy to cover mm. by by television yeah. and it. and mm. it's very skillful. You know, I mean, there's plenty of skill in in this game. Yeah. Andrews, do you want to add something? No, I just uh, very very briefly. I mean, how happy I am that we we covered the hails because if you're looking now this E one point three, which is even further. It says. The, you shall include the words, and then you have a room and tack in quotation marks. You have to use those words, and without this clarification, what the hails can be done any language. You just you can talk your language, but you have to one moment has you you need to use the words room and tack. So, I mean, it's 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 okay now. So uh, yeah. Okay, blue. Uh, actually, we have two questions. From Bobby Lewis, but I think it's uh, it's uh, is already answered. He's asking if he added two rails ever required. I think John answered that. You, you need to keep a rail until it's, it's, it's understood. And uh, and the second one is the rail of tech to room effective as a room to tech rail. I think also others answer that. Yes, okay. the, yeah, the basic principle in the introduction applies to all hails wherever they appear in the book. So, Great. F. Okay, let's, let's go forward. Uh, Appendix F, kiteboarding racing rules. And um, Marina, do you want to deal with this or do you want that I guide and you comment? How do you prefer to do this? Well, it's my baby and... Uh... Uh, you, you promised that we have a, a long uh, uh, session just to cover Appendix F. I think that the, it is important to say that uh, kiteboarding is just three-dimensional fast sailing, and you have to adapt the rules just to accommodate the speed and the third dimension. The kite is moving uh, in in the... in. In, in a third dimension, it's not just uh, in two dimensions uh, as the 
the other boats are moving. So we needed to make uh, some adaptations in the rule for that. Appendix F exists in the rule book already and the changes uh, on, for the next cycle are a bit more substantial than the changes we had in other disciplines because the, the, the sport evolves and there is, there, is, uh, there is progress. So there are some game-changing uh, differences. So we just uh, talk about the game-changing differences here, I understand. Uh, we have one main difference that is... Uh, uh, that there is redress is not available for a boat that uh, whose position is made significantly worse through no fault of her own by a tangle that was caused by a boat breaking uh, rule of part two. It is you know, a boat is still a kiteboard is still able to get redress for damage, injury, and everything else that a, a boat can get redress, but not for a tangle, and this. This change is expected to make sailing more uh, uh, a bit more conservative, that sailors are not going to take so many risks, making it safer for them. Imagine that uh, the kite, kite boards move to on a speed up, up to 35 knots. So if they are coming the opposite direction, it can be pretty dangerous that they, that they crash and they don't have a big boat beam, they are on a, on a small board. It can get dangerous. Uh, this The removal of, uh, of the redress for a tangi has made, and this is expected to make it even more safe with, uh, with less risks. Uh, yeah? Okay. Um, if we start with definitions, no, I, I have a question, Nelson. I have a question about redress. Okay. If you permit to interrupt it. It's for okay. others. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, just to discuss about uh, you know, uh, the rules between different disciplines. Now we have a, a kite body. There is no redress if there is a collision and a tangle. And the widget surf will have a redress for capsizer, that means just the, the mass go in the water, on the water. Uh, did you discuss uh, this is uh, on the for, for wind surfer too? Because I think now it's very different criteria between kites, kites body and uh, and wind surf. Yeah, I, I, I can make a comment. Uh, it was, um, how to say, beginning of the the times when the kite boarding just kind of came in and the first um, um, approach was that are oh, they all the same they are the same boards and they they, they are same sport the same discipline same format so they let's have the same rules and all these years when we have been working with um, with the boards uh, rules working party and, uh, and i think marina can agree with me that technically we are talking about a totally different equipment, totally different formats, it's a totally different game. So there is a technically nothing uh, similar except uh, using the boards, but it's like, like a different boat, so you're using a different hulls and so on. So therefore, uh, I, I would not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really uh, make uh, the, the comparison or comparing that the, the kite has to be the same as a windsurfing or windsurfing has to be the same as kiteboarding, because as I said, they are totally different. And uh, it has been discussed, by the, by the way, about the redress and the capsize, and, uh, and it looks like, um, yeah, why we, why we should give a redress someone who's just capsizing, but as we know that if somebody really causing you capsize, and it's not your fault, uh, you are, you, you're gone, you have nothing to do with this race anymore, so, so it's really unfair. And I would even extend this, this question more further. That if, if we don't want to have a redress for, for capsize, why we need redress at all? I mean, uh, I think all of you in this, this session, we, we know the discussion we, we had for, for years that uh, to, to, to make and create our sport more attractive, we need more trauma. And to have more trauma, we need to make it less safe. 
and when all these this, uh, redresses, they are making the sport safe. So people are saying, ah, oh, but if something happens and then I, I lost all the regatta, well, we have many different other sports where there are no, no redress and people actually just looking because of that, that they, are, they want to see the trauma. So, I mean, uh, at the moment, uh, again, it depends who you are asking this question. If you're asking this question about redress from the sailors or coaches, you can 99.9% get answered, yes, we want it, <laughs> because that's a safer. If you're asking this question from the media person, they said, no readers at all. We want to see the trauma. So that's why I, uh, I'm not personally, I'm not the person to decide if we need readers or not. We are just representing the community. And at the moment, uh, the loudest voice of the community is that, yes, we want it. So unless the, the community, I mean the windsurfing community, wants to change it or agrees to change it or remove the, the, the redress for capsize, we, we just should have it. And, um, and yeah, that's, sorry, a short question, but long answer. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if, I can, if I can comment on that, it is uh, the change in Appendix F came from the community. So the giving redress for, for Tangle, is, is a little different than, uh, I don't have an opinion about the Appendix B redress, but the, the Appendix F redress for Tangle was, was quite different. In order to, to, not, in order to, uh, in order to, to classify that you are in a Tangle, you have to be in a pretty bad situation. You have to be, uh, uh, your your kite needs to be tangled with the other kite in order to arrive to that situation. It it is very easy to to get hurt, and it is very likely that you will create a, a damage to your equipment. And although you are, uh, if if there is a damage or a tangle, you the keep clear boat is the right of way boat is also breaking rule fourteen. It is very difficult to, to prove that the boat didn't do everything she could or the, the boat could have reasonably uh, avoided the contact. So the sailors themselves asked to remove redress to make everybody sail more uh, conservatively to be more reasonable, not to enter in difficult situations who, which might end up in a, in a mess. And this, this worked. Comparing, we applied this rule already in the, the two events that we had uh, after in the post-COVID era. And uh, compared with, uh, with the equivalent event of, uh, of last year, I will give you some numbers with the, with the we had three more sailors at the Europeans this year. And last year we had 45 cases, uh, of which 32 involved redress. And this year we had 30 cases, of which five involved redress. So the difference is, is really, really significant. The people just sail safer. And it seems that it is working. And the, the change came from the sailors. So that's, uh, that's the main uh, difference with the uh, windsurfers who like what they have and they don't want to change it. Okay, perfect. So we, we, we have the change of definition. Maybe, maybe last comment on that. So we, what we okay. need to really uh, take into account is that it's not us who are making the rules for the community. I mean, of course, we are kind of formalizing them, but we are technically, again, we, as Marina said, we are representing the community, what they want. And we have so many different kind of the, the, the sailing and, uh, and, and if, if the community wants, who are us to tell them what, what they can or they should have it or not. So that's why I think it's, uh, we are just like representing the, the community on that. And we have to listen to what they want, then put it in the right words and make it in the rules and then make sure that it is applied in a fair way. Okay, just, just a quick um, 
look in the guides that we have changes in the definition about the overlap. If there is a reasonable doubt, if two kites are overlap, it shall presume that they are not. Both holes are very short. Recovering. A kite's board is recovering from the time she lost steerage away until he regains it, unless she's capsized. Often a kite board may lose storage, steerage away and will recovering without leaving, without having been capsized and her kite ever been in the water. The kite board is recovering from the time her kite is out of the water until she's steerage away. Kite still using hole and competitors for start finish. So not, not only hole, but com, uh, hole and competitor. If you think that the that the board is uh, is maximum one one and a half meter long, it is really really short, and the competitor in proportion is pretty big compared to the to the board. So usually, what you see is the is the person, not the not the board, as a race officer or uh, in the start or the finishing line. Also, the identification is on the body of the of the sailor. So it couldn't be it couldn't be hull. Hull is too small. You cannot many times you don't see it. And it's a flat with water, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So also we have a uh, uh, 15 and 16 and exoneration. So uh, here, here it is a little bit of a, of a philosophic uh, uh, discussion and reasoning. I think that the I think that these changes would be valid for for all boats, not just for kiteboarding. Just in kiteboarding, probably between because of the of the three dimensional nature, it becomes a bit more obvious. So it is possible that you if a if a boat gains the acquires right of way. Uh, to leeward of a of a keep clear uh, boat, which is now to windward, was clear was clear ahead, and now is to windward, and acquires the right of way really really close. The right of way boat immediately breaks rule eleven. The 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 boat that acquired right of way breaks rule fifteen, but and can bear away. It's an example, but can bear away immediately and give the other boat room to keep clear. But for a moment, it had broken Rule 15, and it is not possible to, to unbreak Rule 15. For one moment, it broke Rule 15 because the other boat was not able, was not keeping clear. Uh, this sentence in Rule 15, which then moved into Rule 43 because of the exoneration uh, idea, makes uh, clarifies that in order for a boat to break Rule 15, there needs to be contact. If there was no contact, then it is uh, seized exonerated for the breach. Does it make sense? Okay. In, in, in 16.1? 16, 16 in 16.1, we added the word continue keeping clear, because imagine, again, a windward-leeward scenario where the, the windward board is, uh, is sailing so close to the, to the leeward boat that it is breaking the definition, keep clear. The leeward cannot change, uh, cannot change course imid and without immediately making contact. And then the leeward boat, the right-of-way boat, changes course. You have mm. the windward boat uh, not keeping clear, so breaking rule 11, but the leeward boat is breaking 16.1. And she cannot be exonerated from breaking 16.1 because no one compelled her to change course. That's why by adding to continue keeping clear in 16.1, we make sure that this applies only if the keep clear boat was keeping clear to begin with. And this is no different than, uh, than boats 
but it is a lot more relevant with kites because of the three-dimensional nature. Okay, 16.2 is the same for yeah. both. I'll change the same, the same was the change. Uh, start sequence, now is three minutes. Yeah, it's three minutes because imagine that the, the race is maximum 12 minutes long. And in the, yeah. in the, the Olympic uh, format, it will be six minutes long. So having a, a five minute starting sequence for a six minutes race, it's a little bit of a, it's disproportionate. Also, when you have the, the starting line close to the shore, imagine these things are pretty fast. So it happened when the starting sequence was five minutes long that we displayed warning signal, preparatory signal, and the sailors were still walking on the beach. And then what rules apply? They are racing, but they are walking on the beach. So it's not, it's not really, it's a bit confusing. So with the three minutes, it's, it's better. Okay. And 44.1b. Well, that's a principle. That's a principle for. Uh, again, we have many times a kite board can break a rule, touch a little bit the other kite board, and with the with the penalties that we had until now, she can take a one turn penalty and continue the race. While the other kite board is, is swimming, is then tangled with the lines wrapped around herself and they lose the race and they might even happen to lose the next race if it is a big, uh, if it is a big uh, mess. So this is, it's not really safe. It's not really fair, not safe. It's not really fair. So not only if you gain a significant advantage by your breach, you have to retire. The turn is not enough. But also, if you cause significant disadvantage to the other kite board, you have to retire. The turn is not enough. It happened many times that we had uh, uh, kite boards looking for redress and or protesting, and the other kite board had taken a penalty. There was no further penalty, but it felt unfair. So this is the reason that this uh, addition is in Rule 44. In 44.2, one turn penalty, now it's included uh, foil boards because this is a new... Yeah. So in the, in the past, it, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, accommodate the, the foiling boards and the way it was written, the, the foiling boards were not really complying with the rule, but now it is, uh, it is clear. Okay. And 62, you already talked about. Yeah, we already discussed about. And then 64, it is a, it is a, 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 a consequence. Yeah, it's a consequence of, uh, of, uh, of the change with the tangle. However, it's important to say that we still have, uh, if, if a boat is, uh, we don't want kiteboards causing tangles. So if someone causes it for, for the, one time they get disqualified. If they cause it for a second time, we have a, a principle like what you have in Appendix P with the, with the penalties for breaking Rule 42. You get your second and all subsequent uh, penalties are a DME. This is a Rule 64 group. Yes. Okay. Um, so this this uh, this way we we finish uh, appendix F and I will ask uh, John if you have any comments on that. I know nothing about kite boarding. <laughs> That's not a good thing, John. It's well, not I a think, good thing. I think I'm, retiring. Board, exactly. I'm retiring, Marina. I'll never need to know about kite boarding. <laughs> okay, uh, Anna. No, I don't have any comments. I have to study about kiteboarding too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Andrews? Yeah, maybe one short one. Actually, it's not, not um, uh, existing rule, but I think what is really good in kiteboarding rules, and maybe definitely we need to start thinking about the windsurfing, do the same, and maybe even for sailing, is rule 16.1, and, uh, and uh, what, what's talking about the change of the course, and also adding the change of the position of the equipment. 
because this is something what uh, what maybe it, it's relevant, especially windsurfing. You know, when you are you're not changing a course by hull, but you are changing unexpectedly with the position of the equipment, and that might might cause some problems. Maybe not that much for a normal sailing, but it also can happen. So this is something maybe for further investigation and uh, discussion about that. But it's, it's critical for kiteboarding, so that's why definitely kiteboards need, need it. Perfect. Uh, Blue? Uh, no, no question from audience, but uh, I have a question from Blue. <laughs> uh, this question... I, I believe I believe uh, uh, the kite board found a, a good uh, a question in the race rule about the rule of 15. Uh, actually, it's it's very difficult for, for the the judge penalize a, a boat for 15 without contact. We have a case talk about similar like maneuver for the keep it clear boat, but. But I think it is this problem is there since night six, and uh, where a boat can you know tack too close uh, without giving room for the keep it clear boat to, 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 to keep clear. But then at the last minute, uh, the right of way, the new right of way boat avoid the contact, and uh, usually we green flag this or we dismiss the process. I would like to ask uh, John if he, uh, uh, the uh, the rule committee uh, did he consider to, to change the rules for for boats also. I don't. I mean, I mean the way it works is we we have working parties for look after the boards and the kites and all the different disciplines, and they come forward with their proposals for their uh, own discipline. And we do look at them to see, and I think there are some rules that would be beneficial in the in the main rules. Uh, I actually agree with Marina that there is a problem in rules 15 and 16. Not not everybody agrees that there's a problem, um, but but I think we do agree there is a problem with those rules, and we need to address we need to address that and find out. Um, oh, I'm not sure if that answers your question very well, but um... oh yes, yes, just uh, it's, I, I believe that uh, it was a good improvement uh, for 15 and 16, and maybe we should uh, there can be a solution also for the, the discussion we have on, on, on board, and uh, that, that that's that's a good point. Yeah. So that's a job for the next committee. Uh, I think we've. I think so far we've got. We know of twenty things that need fixing for the next rule book, but but we're not going to tell you them all because. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. So um, can we move to Appendix G? Yeah. Identification on sales. I think that the most, uh, uh, well, first of all, general class insignia national letters and sale numbers where applicable shall be placed in, on both sides and such that those on the starboard sides uh, are uppermost. Two, national letters shall be placed above the sale numbers on each side of the sale. It was... Um, a common practice already now is in, in the appendix. And the, the main change is Singapore um, letters that before was uh, seen and now it's SGP. Uh, Blue can, can tell us the, the reason or who wants to, say, to tell. This is, we just follow, we've just followed the IOC codes. We, we have nothing to do with it. Um, we just take whatever the uh, International Olympic Committee use for the countries that are affiliated to world sailing. So really hard for us to know what the answer is. But I think that Singapore did not like being called sinful. <laughs> exactly, I think that yeah. was the one of the 
new guidelines, uh, new guidance in hear, hearsay evidence. And John? Well, Anna can, can respond to most of it, but we realise that there is an issue which looks like a... I think we talked about it in the last session. Uh, because in M3.2, if you go down to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's about the eighth point, it starts off, uh, the process which should accept written evidence from a witness who is not available to be questioned only if all parties agree. That, that seems and is, is not really very, we, we should have updated it along with the, that you have to have, you have to take hearsay evidence and then give it weight. Um, so, but as M is only guidance, it's not a rule, uh, we give preference to the rule um, and we will, uh, I'm probably holding, is where Marina gets her own back on me. Am I holding this one up as well, this Q&A, Marina? <laughs> Yeah, I, will not, I will not comment in public. Continue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, I am. There is, there is a Q&A which effectively says um, that this means that the parties can, can accept written evidence as agreed or they say it should be disputed. It's not very pretty and we will we'll be working on this but the rule takes precedence over guidance. Okay. Um, Andrews? Yeah, I just want to point out one thing, which is really good now. I mean, if you're looking at the M3.2, which is technically the, the order of the hearing, and it's really uh, makes, it's like a reordered in a logic way. And which is important is uh, if you see the second, second item, invite questions for a protest committee, it has been removed to the down. And that's really important because we still can see some juries or protest committees where after the even the first uh, statement by a protestor, the, the protest committee members jumping in with the questions. And we all know that this is not acceptable because with these questions, we are kind of leading, we may lead the protestee to give his, his statement. So we're always keeping the jury questions on the last. And, but if, uh, in the previous time, it hasn't been uh, I mean, uh, clarified that way, so that's why we can see still this, I would say, error, or it's not really error, but it's not acceptable procedure. So this guideline is now clarifies it. So if people are just reading how to run the hearing or how to act in the hearing, this is a logical order now. So I think this is important. Anna? Uh, yeah, I think this, this Appendix M is obviously in the to do list for the next cycle, and uh, if if we if we go and read the the judges' manual, for example, which is now under review, um, we will see that this appendix and conflict sometimes with uh, the advice given by the manual. So um, I think that uh, judges should should read both documents and, and, and at least give, uh, I would say, find their own, their own way. I mean, compared to the rule, what is really good practice? And in the, and the case as uh, uh, Andrews highlighted, um, I don't think too many uh, protest committees in the, last, in the last four years started by making questions from the protest committee. I think most of us just waited until the end. Um, so I, I, I guess that judges around the world are able to find what is good practice in both in the rules and in the, in the manual and compare it with this appendix. But it should be reviewed. So Blue, can you just go to the top of appendix M? Because the very first sentence is really quite important in, in light of these discussions that, that we have. It says, this appendix is advisory only. Um, 
And Absolutely. of course, I totally agree with Anna. It should be good practice and we need to overhaul it and bring everything into, into line. Um, but the fact is, it is advisory and it's not a rule in itself. All right. Thank you. Very good. Okay, and then we go for Appendix N, International Juries. There is no changes. Now, there's one, there's one quite important change. Okay. Right? N1.4 Bravo. Now, you don't have to say anything in the sailing instructions if you want to use a three-person panel. Mm. Uh, un until now, it, you have to put something in the sailing instructions about when the time limit for referring a decision to a full panel. Now that's automatic and it's 30 minutes unless it's changed in the sailing instructions, which means you don't need a sailing instruction to set up a three-person panel. And I think that particularly in the current times of COVID, and we're trying to sometimes reduce the number of people in, in, in a space, uh, using three-person panels is uh, probably uh, help is in the helpful direction for avoiding contact more than necessary. Okay, yeah, it's, it's important, yeah. Um, Appendix P, special procedures for Rule 42. No. Anna, any comments? Uh, no, I think it's, it's quite a straightforward. There are no changes. Yeah, changing events for regatta. Yeah, but that's the general general consistency. Yeah. And uh, appendix error procedures for appeals and requests. I think it's also nothing important. We cover appendix S standard save instructions, and the last last appendix. Appendix T, arbitration. Who wants to comment, if there is any comment? Anna? Um, there is nothing new in here, and, and it makes a reference to the judge's manual uh, for more guidance. And, but that's it. I think uh, this, this appendix has been working quite well since it was included in the, in the rule book. John? Nothing to add. Um, uh, Andrus? Yeah, maybe maybe one thing actually, maybe, uh, uh, is that if we all, all know and we can see that uh, something is missing, actually it's not missing anymore, but it's not in a book, which is a template of um, protest form or hearing form, and uh, we, we know that uh, uh, that there's a no requirement to use a specific form. You can use even a blank paper for that, but still some people not, are not that familiar. I all received the question that, ah, oh, but why, 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 the, why the protest form is not in a book anymore? So, uh, and, uh, and it's just, just uh, the clarification that you, we, don't, we don't need to be on a book because you can use any, any, any form and it's uh, definitely, it's not anymore the protest form, it's just a hearing request form. And I think, John, you were the initiator or who created this this uh, change, and many others. I don't know if you want to comment, give people some overview on that. Yeah, I mean, we think that it's just more useful to be online because you can then download it and you can add. A, and we will we're, we're we're working on editing the final version, um, and there will be a, both a Word version and a PDF version uh, available online. Of, of a any as you say it's the recommended form it's not a mandatory form um, and the reason we put a word version up is it's then very easy to add an event logo to the form and and, and customize it um, and and uh, it's it's been in practice at a lot of events for the last three years uh, it's not particularly new um, but it does reflect the fact that we have five different kinds of, of possible hearings. And, and they have different rules for, for each hearing in, in some respects. So, so they can be protests, requests for redress, um, a support person report, misconduct, or, and it's not 
technically a hearing, but a decision is required, is a request to reopen. And the form is often used as a request to reopen, although it doesn't always lead to a hearing. So we just think that the new form reflects the rule book um, and, and has less tick boxes all over it uh, because one of the problem with tick boxes is unless you put all the tick boxes in <laughs> and, and we know that if you actually go through the rule book and check every rule that you have to check in a hearing, you actually need a complete page all on its own and that will also be available online. So we use a checklist um, for a lot of hearings we'll make that available online for people to download as well. Marina? Yeah, and uh, to add to what uh, John says, uh, a lot of events, and it's getting more and more, are not using uh, the, the paper form at all anyway, and are using uh, an, electronic, uh, an electronic system that you can, you just complete your, your hearing request online and submit it online. There is no paper involved at all. So this also for this reason it's not it's not really necessary to have it in the to have it in the book. And the, the time the, the digital age and the, the coronavirus pandemic made us realize it a lot more. Yeah. A lot of the things are becoming a lot uh, easier and communication is is becoming a lot easier we wouldn't we would probably not be doing this if we hadn't been shown the way to do it in the uh, during the the covid days what we're doing now i mean actually okay. just one moment, we, no, just, uh, yeah yeah and also, so actually the last last week there was one one event when uh, where the, it was also tried to have a, as, as much as online as possible. And one sailor just front of the committee just typed the, the request for the hearing, the protest on the WhatsApp. I mean, that was a, like a sale WhatsApp and uh, all requirements were met on the 61.2, so defined and that was okay. That yeah. was absolutely valid, valid, valid request. So. Perfect. We, we arrive in the end of the of the, um, our guides, uh, but not in the end of the, our meeting. So I would uh, suggest that uh, just just for before we finish, uh, starting with Marina, uh, we just do a quick uh, report about how how the, the COVID is impacted sailing in, in your area or in your uh, uh, activities, because you are not only uh, stuck it in one place, and how 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 it's now um, the situation. Well, the, I live in Greece, and uh, there are not a lot of races happening in my in my country. There are no international races happening in my country, and there are some uh, some regional events, but not not really a lot. But there is there is uh, activity of uh, at the yacht clubs people go sailing and it is considered a safe thing to to do. Uh, I am involved in uh, in a lot of uh, kiteboarding events. There were it was not able to do any world championships or world events this year, mainly because the uh, competitors could not travel, not competitors from all over the world could travel to the to the venue. But we had uh, European championships for both for individual and for team, uh, Formula Kite, which is the, the Olympic equipment for the next Olympic Games. The next, I mean, after the Tokyo Olympics, the Paris ones. And the, there were... There were no countries, these events are normally are open and countries from all over the world can go. There were not, there were no sailors from other countries outside Europe. And uh, this was apart from a, a handful that live in Europe, but have a, a passport from somewhere else. Uh, but apart from that, there was, uh, there was good attendance from sailors from Europe and very good level. We, we, we did 
everything we had and we we should do for because of COVID, we just adapted to the to the requirements, to the new reality. A lot of the things that we had to do, we were already doing. So the online notice board, the online everything that has to do with the, with the jury is online. We don't use paper since several years. There is nothing on paper. Uh, the, the diff, one of the differences is that the competitor's briefing was made on a, on a platform like the one we are using, we are using now. And uh, everyone was very well behaved and they were, these meetings went really well. It's a lot more convenient to do the meeting drinking coffee at the hotel than having to be at the venue at eight o'clock in the morning to do that. So it is, it was easier, it was more comfortable to have, uh, to be at the event with this uh, condition. We have a WhatsApp group where all the sailors were, they would not go to the race officer, to the jury and ask for uh, information. They would ask it on the WhatsApp. So we, everyone knew everything that was going on that works better than having than telling each one, answering the question individually. Uh, we use the three-person uh, panels and that worked also quite well because you had, we had a full jury at the event and the other two people were there to, uh, to organize who goes in, uh, who is waiting, uh, finalize the, the scoring, right uh, quality control on the on what the people who were doing the hearing were writing in facts conclusion decision so in uh, the bottom line is that the event was better run apart from the fact that we had to wear masks and we couldn't hug each other is better run with the, with the covid restrictions than without we like all the all the electronic uh, applications on the event. Very good. Um, Anna, how the things are going south of Europe? Well, in Spain, um, we managed to do some events, not as many as we could have done in a normal summer, but, um, but still we could do something uh, especially the nationals, uh, the national championships. And uh, I had the opportunity to join the Optimist Nationals, and, and it was amazing. I mean, we had a virtual race office, virtual um, uh, notice board, etc. But apart from that, we had so many new rules for the for the sailors to follow about safety and masks and and washing the hands and, and safety distance and etc. And and they just simply followed the rules. So I think everybody is, is ready to change a little bit uh, the, the, what we have been doing up to now if changing a little bit our traditions we can continue racing and sailing safely. So I, I am really hoping that we can continue racing. John? Um, well, I'm going racing on Saturday morning. I'm doing the main sheet on a cruiser racer, so <laughs> I'm all right. And we, we anticipate uh, 85 keelboats out on, on Saturday morning. Um, it's a traditional race in, in my club. It's the last race of the year in the normal in, in the normal season. Um, so there's a lot, quite a lot of club racing. Um, there's some regional sailing, but, but interestingly, our local community in our town, they so the council do not want us to run open meetings because we're in a holiday area and they do not want people coming. And we're also in a very low COVID area in the country. And the council want to, us not to encourage people to come into the area um, for fear of bringing um, the, the virus in. So, that, so we're being driven not just by uh, regulations, but by the local community quite a lot. Um, 
The other thing that I'd like to say um, is that World Sailing have issued a question and answer on how do you invoke uh, COVID regulations, if you like, into an event and into the documentation. Uh, and that, uh, we think that's worth reading. So please have a look at the latest. That one is published. Uh, and we, we don't recommend um, invoking the... Sorry, I need to start from the beginning. So there will be law in the country. There is also guidance in the country. And most events have to write what we would call protocols about implementing behaviour to cope with the, the virus. We, we do not recommend making those rules of the regatta as such. They, we, we obviously think they have to be published, and like Anna says, people will follow them. But what we suggest you avoid is, is having them as documents governing the event which would then make that document, a, a breach of it, becomes protestable directly. Now, the problem with that is that means the protest committee have got to interpret whether it's a law, a guidance, or, or whatever it is. And how can, if it's guidance, how can you break it? So, and we've had a lot of, there's a lot of talk in the UK on the news every day about is it law or is it guidance? Do we have to do this? Is this mandatory? Is that non, not mandatory? And I don't know if it's the same in every country, but I've heard it's pretty similar. People just don't know. And, and, the, and these rules are changing very rapidly, um, sometimes overnight in different countries. And they'll be published in the local language. So if you're doing an international event, Nobody even hears about the rules. So if you say, if you have a, a notice of race that says you shall follow government law, this is race that says you shall follow government law, because somebody's going to break that law, and then you end up with the protest committee judging law. And, and we, we, we always avoid that. Um, we might call it misconduct if you, if you, if you break a law. What we do suggest, though, in the in, in the Q and A, is that you add into your sailing instructions uh, a sailing instruction that simply says you shall comply with reasonable requests of official of event officials or race officials. And it's it's when you don't comply with a reasonable request that you become subject to penalty. And, and that puts a one step away from so it's. A, if you know there's a published document that says you shall wear face masks and you're not wearing one, an official says to you, please could you wear your face mask and you refuse, now you're protestable or, and you could be penalised for it. And uh, well, for all the reasons I've, I've given, we think that this is a, the most sensible approach. Um, you will probably... So you need to make, if you do put any any... Um, other regulations in, they need to be discretionary penalties. Otherwise, you're going to have your hands tied very strongly. Enough of the preaching, but I think it's quite important for getting the sport going on, under this environment. Uh, and we've already agreed that that's the approach that we will take for the Olympic Games uh, if the Olympics goes ahead. Andrews? Yes, I mean... Um... Uh, we are slightly different, maybe because of the small, small country. But uh, so our sailing season, summer sailing season starts usually in May. And we are now about to, to end it. So a few, few offshore regatta still uh, uh, events left. But actually, I would have to say that we, we had a full, full schedule. Full schedule of all, all events. So we run the all, all legs of Estonian championships for, for, for youth and Olympic classes and uh, offshore regattas. So there was, as far I, I know, there, were, there had been no event which has been cancelled because of COVID. So that's why it's, it's very strange nowadays to say it, but we had a full and normal sailing season. And, uh, but at the same time, yes, I mean, we're using also the online, online system and uh, all electronic as, as much as possible. So, um, so the, yeah, the situation has, hasn't been. And which is also very interesting that um, uh, because these events, we had quite many 
our neighbors came to Estonian event, like, uh, I mean, uh, Finland, uh, Latvia, Lithuania. So all these events have been very good participation also from, from those countries. And so we, we look, looks like it's, it's all, all right, all good. But now it's increasing now as well, but uh, as, as everywhere. Uh, but uh, but uh, summer season is almost over and winter season didn't start yet. So <laughs> we have time to set up our, um, our goals. Okay, Blue, do you want to, to add something about Brazil? And then we finish. Yes, uh, we have uh, regional regattas. Uh, the Snipe class is very active in Rio. Uh, we are doing a lot of events. And uh, actually, Rio, I think, it is the, the place that they started first. And we receive people from other states. And uh, But we have only local regatta, but with the people from other regions. And they, I, we are doing a lot of uh, online stuff, you know. We, we are doing online hearings. We are doing online arbitration. Uh, we are doing actually the notice board now moved to WhatsApp and we, 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 we did a lot of online and people are, I agree with Marina, the people are really enjoying you know, not being waiting uh, in front of the protest room. Uh, for hours waiting for the protest. I think the the online schedule can 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 be more efficient somehow, and uh, especially of course on, on local events. I'm not not talking about a big event, but the local events. Uh, this online is uh, procedure is is being, is being applied very successful. And uh, I think we keep in, we keep in doing it after the, the the COVID. Okay, thank you very much, John, Anna, Marina, Andrus, and Ricardo for this uh, meeting, and also to everybody that uh, was uh, follow us to uh, YouTube. This this chat uh, this meeting will be available um, in YouTube. You can you can find uh, uh, Ricardo. We will leave the, the, the link. Or is the same link that you that that if you are seeing now is the same link to see the records of this meeting. And thank you very much for everybody uh, for for join us and. Good night. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, it's a big pleasure to see you out. Okay. Okay.